theatre or theatre is a collaborative form of fine art that uses live performers to present the experience of a real or imagined event before a live audience in a specific place. The performers may communicate this experience to the audience through combinations of gesture, speech, song, music, and dance. Elements of design and stagecraft are used to enhance the physicality, presence and immediacy of the experience. The specific place of the performance is also named by the word theatre as derived from the ancient Greek ii plus or minus ii ii one half, itself from ii micron ii one quarter ii plus or minus i to the first. Modern Western theatre derives in large measure from ancient Greek drama, from which it borrows technical terminology, classification into genres, and many of its themes, stock characters, and plot elements. Theatre scholar Patrice Pavis defines theatricality, theatrical language, stage writing, and the specificity of theatre as synonymous expressions that differentiate theatre from the other performing arts, literature, and the arts in general. Theatre today, broadly defined, includes performances of plays and musicals, ballets, operas and various other forms. History Classical and Hellenistic Greece the city-state of Athens is where Western theatre originated. It was part of a broader culture of theatricality and performance in classical Greece that included festivals, religious rituals, politics, law, athletics and gymnastics, music, poetry, weddings, funerals, and symposia. Participation in the city-state's many festivals a Euro and attendance at the city Dionysia as an audience member in particular a Euro was an important part of citizenship. Civic participation also involved the evaluation of the rhetoric of orators evidenced in performances in the law court or political assembly, both of which were understood as analogous to the theatre and increasingly came to absorb its dramatic vocabulary. The Greeks also developed the concepts of dramatic criticism, acting as a career, and theatre architecture. The theatre of ancient Greece consisted of three types of drama, tragedy, comedy, and the satyr play. The origins of theatre in ancient Greece, according to Aristotle, the first theoretician of theatre, are to be found in the festivals that honoured Dionysus the performances were given in semicircular auditoria cut into hillsides, capable of seating 10,000 a Euro 20,000 people. The stage consisted of a dancing floor, dressing room and scene building area. Since the words were the most important part, good acoustics and clear delivery were paramount. The actors wore masks appropriate to the characters they represented, and each might play several parts. Athenian tragedia euro The oldest surviving form of tragedia euro is a type of dance drama that formed an important part of the theatrical culture of the city-state. Having emerged sometime during the 6th century BCE, it flowered during the 5th century BCE and continued to be popular until the beginning of the Hellenistic period. No tragedies from the 6th century BCE and only 32 of the more than a thousand that were performed in during the 5th century BCE have survived. We have complete texts extant by Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. The origins of tragedy remain obscure, though by the 5th century BCE it was institutionalized in competitions held as part of festivities celebrating Dionysos. As contestants in the city Dionysia's competition playwrights were required to present a tetralogy of plays, which usually consisted of three tragedies and one satyr play. The performance of tragedies at the city Dionysia may have begun as early as 534 BCE. Official records begin from 501 BCE, when the satyr play was introduced. Most Athenian tragedies dramatize events from Greek mythology, though the Persian Euro which stages the Persian response to news of their military defeat at the Battle of Salamis in 480 BCE a Euro is the notable exception in the surviving drama. When Aeschylus won first prize for it at the city Dionysia in 472 BCE, he had been writing tragedies for more than 25 years, yet its tragic treatment of recent history is the earliest example of drama to survive. More than 130 years later, the philosopher Aristotle analyzed 5th century Athenian tragedy in the oldest surviving work of dramatic theatre Euro his poetics. Athenian comedy is conventionally divided into three periods, old comedy, middle comedy, and new comedy. 
old comedy survives today largely in the form of the eleven surviving plays of Aristophanes, while middle comedy is largely lost. New comedy is known primarily from the substantial papyrus fragments of Menander. Aristotle defined comedy as a representation of laughable people that involves some kind of blunder or ugliness that does not cause pain or disaster. Roman Theatre Western theatre developed and expanded considerably under the Romans. The Roman historian Livy wrote that the Romans first experienced theatre in the 4th century BCE, with a performance by Etruscan actors. Beecham argues that they had been familiar with pre-theatrical practices for some time before that recorded contact. The theatre of ancient Rome was a thriving and diverse art form, ranging from festival performances of street theatre, new dancing, and acrobatics, to the staging of Plautus's broadly appealing situation comedies, to the high style, verbally elaborate tragedies of Seneca. Although Rome had a native tradition of performance, the Hellenization of Roman culture in the 3rd century BCE had a profound and energizing effect on Roman theatre and encouraged the development of Latin literature of the highest quality for the stage. The only surviving Roman tragedies, indeed the only plays of any kind from the Roman Empire, are ten dramas nine of them Palilara attributed to Leoquis and Nanius Seneca, the Cordoba born Stoic philosopher and tutor of Nero. Post classical theatre in the West Theatre took on many alternate forms in the West between the 15th and 19th centuries, including commedia delit and melodrama. The general trend was away from the poetic drama of the Greeks and the Renaissance and toward a more naturalistic prose style of dialogue, especially following the Industrial Revolution. Theatre took a big pause during 1642 and 1660 in England because of Cromwell's interregnum. Theatre was seen as something sinful and the Puritans tried very hard to drive it out of their society. Because of this stagnant period, once Charles II came back to the throne in 1660 and the Restoration, theatre exploded because of a lot of influence from France, where Charles was in exile the years previous to his reign. One of the big changes was the new theatre house. Instead of the types in the Elizabethan era that were like the Globe Theatre, round with no place for the actors to really prep for the next act and with no theatre manners, a Euro it transformed into a place of refinement, with a stage in front and somewhat stadium seating in front of it. This way, seating was more prioritised because some seats were obviously better than others because the seating was no longer all the way around the stage. The king would have the best seat in the house, the very middle of the theatre, which got the widest view of the stage as well as the best way to see the point of view and vanishing point that the stage was constructed around. Philippe Jacques de Lauterbourg was one of the most influential set designers of the time because of his use of floor space and scenery. Because of the turmoil before this time, there was still some controversy about what should and should not be put on the stage. Jeremy Collier, a preacher, was one of the heads in this movement through his piece A Short View of the Immorality and Profaneness of the English Stage. The beliefs in this paper were mainly held by non-theatre goers and the remainder of the Puritans and very religious of the time. The main question was if seeing something immoral on stage affects behaviour in the lives of those who watch it, a controversy that is still playing out today. The 18th century also introduced women to the stage, which was viewed as inappropriate before. These women were looked at as celebrities but on the other hand, it was still very new and revolutionary that they were on the stage and some said they were unladylike and looked down on. Charles II did not like young men playing the parts of young women, so he asked that women play their own parts. Because women were allowed on the stage, playwrights had more leeway with plot twists like dressing them up as men and narrow escapes of morally sticky situations as forms of comedy. Comedies were full of the young and very much in vogue, with the storyline following their love lives, commonly a young roguish hero professing his love to the chaste and free-minded heroine near the end of the play, much like Sheridan's The School for Scandal. Many of the comedies were fashioned after the French tradition, mainly Moliere, again hailing back to the French influence brought back by the king and the royals after their exile. Moliere was one of the top comedic playwrights of the time, revolutionizing the way comedy was written and performed by combining Comédie Delert, French comedy and satire to create some of the longest-lasting and most influential satiric comedies. Tragedies were similarly victorious in their sense of writing political power, 
especially poignant because of the recent restoration to the crown. They were also imitations of French tragedy, although the French had a larger distinction between comedy and tragedy, whereas the English fudged the lines occasionally and put some comedic parts in their tragedies. Common forms of non-comedic plays were sentimental comedies as well as something that would later be called tragedy bourgeois, the tragedy of common life, were more popular in England because they applied more to the English sensibilities. Through the 19th century, the popular theatrical forms of romanticism, melodrama, Victorian burlesque and the well-made plays of Scribe and Sardo gave way to the problem plays of naturalism and realism. The farces of Feudo. Wagner's operatic Psamt Kunstwerk. Musical theatre. F. C. Burnham's, W. S. Gilbert's and Wilde's drawing room comedies. Symbolism. Proto-expressionism in the late works of August Strindberg and Henrik Ibsen. And Edwardian musical comedy. These trends continued through the 20th century and the realism of Stanislavski and Lee Strasberg, the political theatre of Owen Piscator and Bertolt Brecht the so-called theatre of the absurd of Samuel Beckett and Eugen Ionesco, American and British musicals, the collective creations of companies of actors and directors such as Joan Littlewood's Theatre Workshop, experimental and postmodern theatre of Robert Wilson and Robert LePage, the post-colonial theatre of August Wilson or Thompson Highway, and Augusto Bowles' Theatre of the Oppressed. Eastern Theatrical Traditions The first form of Indian theatre was the Sanskrit theatre. It began after the development of Greek and Roman theatre and before the development of theatre in other parts of Asia. It emerged sometime between the 2nd century BCE and the 1st century CE and flourished between the 1st century CE and the 10th, which was a period of relative peace in the history of India during which hundreds of plays were written. Japanese forms of kabuki, na, and kaya gen developed in the 17th century CE. Theatre in the medieval Islamic world included puppet theatre and live passion plays known as tazir, where actors reenact episodes from Muslim history. In particular, Shia Islamic plays revolved around the Shahid of Ali sons Hassan ibn Ali and Hussain ibn Ali. Secular plays were known as akhreja, recorded in medieval Adab literature, though they were less common than puppetry and tazir theatre. Types, Drama Drama is the specific mode of fiction represented in performance. The term comes from a Greek word meaning action, which is derived from the verb iii per mil, draso, to do, or to act. The enactment of drama in theatre, performed by actors on a stage before an audience, presupposes collaborative modes of production and a collective form of reception. The structure of dramatic texts, unlike other forms of literature, is directly influenced by this collaborative production and collective reception. The early modern tragedy Hamlet by Shakespeare and the classical Athenian tragedy Oedipus the King by Sophocles are among the masterpieces of the art of drama. A modern example is Long Day's Journey into Night by Eugene O'Neill. Considered as a genre of poetry in general, the dramatic mode has been contrasted with the epic and the lyrical modes ever since Aristotle's Poetics a Euro the earliest work of dramatic theory. The use of drama in the narrow sense to designate a specific type of play dates from the 19th century. Drama in this sense refers to a play that is neither a comedy nor a tragedy a Euro for example, Zola's The Copyright Rase Rakin or Shekhov's Ivanov. In ancient Greece however, the word drama encompassed all theatrical plays, tragic, comic, or anything in between. Drama is often combined with music and dance, the drama in opera is generally sung throughout. Musicals generally include both spoken dialogue and songs. And some forms of drama have incidental music or musical accompaniment underscoring the dialogue. In certain periods of history some dramas have been written to be read rather than performed. In improvisation, the drama does not pre-exist the moment of performance. Performers devise a dramatic script spontaneously before an audience. Musical theatre Music and theatre have had a close relationship since ancient Timis a Euro-Athenian tragedy, for example, was a form of dance drama that employed a chorus whose parts were sung, as were some of the actors' responses and their solo songs. Modern musical theatre is a form of theatre that also combines music, spoken dialogue, and dance. It emerged from comic opera, variety, vaudeville, 
and music hall genres of the late 19th and early 20th century. After the Edwardian musical comedy that began in the 1890s, the Princess Theatre musicals of the early 20th century, and comedies in the 1920s and 1930s, with Oklahoma. Musicals moved in a more dramatic direction. Famous musicals over the subsequent decades included My Fair Lady, West Side Story, The Fantastics, Hair, A Chorus Line, Les Misa Copyright Rables and The Phantom of the Opera, as well as more contemporary hits including Rent, The Lion King and Wicked. Musical theatre may be produced on an intimate scale off-Broadway, in regional theatres, and elsewhere, but it often includes spectacle. For instance, Broadway and West End musicals often include lavish costumes and sets supported by multi-million dollar budgets. Comedy Theatre productions that use humor as a vehicle to tell a story qualify as comedies. This may include a modern farce such as Boeing Boeing or a classical play such as As You Like It. Theatre expressing bleak, controversial or taboo subject matter in a deliberately humorous way is referred to as black comedy. Tragedy Tragedy, then, is an imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and of a certain magnitude. In language embellished with each kind of artistic ornament, the several kinds being found in separate parts of the play. In the form of action, not of narrative. Through pity and fear affecting the proper purgation of these emotions. Aristotle's phrase several kinds being found in separate parts of the play is a reference to the structural origins of drama. In it the spoken parts were written in the Attic dialect whereas the choral ones in the Doric dialect, these discrepancies reflecting the differing religious origins and poetic meters of the parts that were fused into a new entity, the theatrical drama. Tragedy refers to a specific tradition of drama that has played a unique and important role historically in the self-definition of Western civilization. That tradition has been multiple and discontinuous yet the term has often been used to invoke a powerful effect of cultural identity and historical continuity a Euro the Greeks and the Elizabethans, in one cultural form. Hellenes and Christians, in a common activity, as Raymond Williams puts it. From its obscure origins in the theatres of Athens 22500 years ago, from which there survives only a fraction of the work of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, through its singular articulations in the works of Shakespeare, Lope de Vega, Racine, and Schiller, to the more recent naturalistic tragedy of Strindberg, Beckett's modernist meditations on death, loss and suffering, and Ma one quarter Lair's postmodernist reworkings of the tragic canon, tragedy has remained an important site of cultural experimentation, negotiation, struggle, and change. In the wake of Aristotle's poetics, tragedy has been used to make genre distinctions, whether at the scale of poetry in general or at the scale of the drama. In the modern era, tragedy has also been defined against drama, melodrama, the tragicomic, and epic theatre. Improvisation Improvisation has been a consistent feature of theatre, with the Commedia dell'art in the 16th century being recognized as the first improvisation form. Popularized by Nobel Prize winner Dario Fo and troops such as the Upright Citizens Brigade improvisational theatre continues to evolve with many different streams and philosophies. Keith Johnston and Viola Spolin are recognized as the first teachers of improvisation in modern times, with Johnston exploring improvisation as an alternative to scripted theatre and the American Spolin and her successors exploring improvisation principally as a tool for developing dramatic work or skills or as a form for situational comedy. Theories of Theatre Having been an important part of human culture for more than 2,500 years, theatre has evolved a wide range of different theories and practices. Some are related to political or spiritual ideologies, while others are based purely on artistic concerns. Some processes focus on a story, some on theatre as event, and some on theatre as catalyst for social change. The classical Greek philosopher Aristotle's Poetics is the earliest surviving example and its arguments have influenced theories of theatre ever since. In it, he offers an account of what he calls poetry. He examines its first principles, and identifies its genres and basic elements. His analysis of tragedy constitutes the core of the discussion. He argues that tragedy consists of six qualitative parts, which are mythos or plot, ethos or character, 
dianoia or thought, lexis or diction, melos or song, and opsis or spectacle. Although Aristotle's poetics is universally acknowledged in the Western critical tradition, Marvin Carlson explains, almost every detail about his seminal work has aroused divergent opinions. Important theatre practitioners of the 20th century include Konstantin Stanislavski, Vsevolod Mierold, Jack Coppo, Edward Gordon Craig, Bertolt Brecht, Antonin Artaud, Joan Littlewood, Peter Brook, Jerzy Grotowski, Augusto Boll, Eugenio Barber, Dario Fo, Keith Johnston and Robert Wilson. Stanislavski treated the theatre as an art form that is autonomous from literature and one in which the playwright's contribution should be respected as that of only one of an ensemble of creative artists. His innovative contribution to modern acting theory has remained at the core of mainstream Western performance training for much of the last century. That many of the precepts of his system of actor training seem to be common sense and self-evident testifies to its hegemonic success. Actors frequently employ his basic concepts without knowing they do so. Thanks to its promotion and elaboration by acting teachers who were former students and the many translations of his theoretical writings, Stanislavski's system acquired an unprecedented ability to cross cultural boundaries and developed an international reach, dominating debates about acting in Europe and the United States. Many actors routinely equate his system with the North American method. Although the latter's exclusively psychological techniques contrast sharply with Stanislavski's multivariant, holistic and psychophysical approach, which explores character and action both from the inside out and the outside in and treats the actor's mind and body as parts of a continuum. Technical Aspects of Theatre Theatre presupposes collaborative modes of production and a collective form of reception. The structure of dramatic texts, unlike other forms of literature, is directly influenced by this collaborative production and collective reception. The production of plays usually involves contributions from a playwright, director, a cast of actors, and a technical production team that includes a scenic or set designer, lighting designer, costume designer, sound designer, stage manager, and production manager. Depending on the production, this team may also include a composer, dramaturg, video designer, or fight director. Stagecraft is a generic term referring to the technical aspects of theatrical, film, and video production. It includes, but is not limited to, constructing and rigging scenery, hanging and focusing of lighting, design and procurement of costumes, makeup, procurement of props, stage management, and recording and mixing of sound. Stagecraft is distinct from the wider umbrella term of scenography. Considered a technical rather than an artistic field, it relates primarily to the practical implementation of a designer's artistic vision. In its most basic form, stagecraft is managed by a single person who arranges all scenery, costumes, lighting, and sound, and organizes the cast. At a more professional level, for example modern Broadway houses, stagecraft is managed by hundreds of skilled carpenters, painters, electricians, stagehands, stitchers, wig makers, and the like. This modern form of stagecraft is highly technical and specialized, it comprises many sub-disciplines and a vast trove of history and tradition. The majority of stagecraft lies between these two extremes. Regional theatres and larger community theatres will generally have a technical director and a complement of designers, each of whom has a direct hand in their respective designs. Theatre organization and administration, there are many modern theatre movements which go about producing theatre in a variety of ways. Theatrical enterprise varies enormously in sophistication and purpose. People who are involved vary from professionals to hobbyists to spontaneous novices. Theatre can be performed with no money at all or on a grand scale with multi-million dollar budgets. This diversity manifests in the abundance of theatre subcategories, which include Broadway theatre and West End theatre, community theatre, dinner theatre, fringe theatre, off-Broadway and off-West End, off-off-Broadway, regional theatre in the United States, summer stock theatre, repertory companies. While most modern theatre companies rehearse one piece of theatre at a time, perform that piece for a set run, retire the piece, and begin rehearsing a new show, repertory companies rehearse multiple shows at one time. 
these companies are able to perform these various pieces upon request and often perform works for years before retiring them. Most dance companies operate on this repertory system. The Royal National Theatre in London performs on a repertory system. Repertory theatre generally involves a group of similarly accomplished actors, and relies more on the reputation of the group than on an individual star actor. It also typically relies less on strict control by a director and less on adherence to theatrical conventions, since actors who have worked together in multiple productions can respond to each other without relying as much on convention or external direction. Producing versus presenting, in order to put on a piece of theatre, both a theatre company and a theatre venue are needed. When a theatre company is the sole company in residence at a theatre venue, this theatre are called a resident theatre or a producing theatre, because the venue produces its own work. Other theatre companies, as well as dance companies, do not have their own theatre venue. These companies perform at rental theatres or at presenting theatres. Both rental and presenting theatres have no full-time resident companies. They do, however, sometimes have one or more part-time resident companies, in addition to other independent partner companies who arrange to use the space when available. A rental theatre allows the independent companies to seek out the space, while a presenting theatre seeks out the independent companies to support their work by presenting them on their stage. Some performance groups perform in non-theatrical spaces. Such performances can take place outside or inside, in a non-traditional performance space, and include street theatre, and site-specific theatre. Non-traditional venues can be used to create more immersive or meaningful environments for audiences. They can sometimes be modified more heavily than traditional theatre venues, or can accommodate different kinds of equipment, lighting and sets. A touring company is an independent theatre or dance company that travels, often internationally, being presented at a different theatre in each city. Unions There are many theatre unions including Actors' Equity Association, the Stage Directors and Choreographers Society, and the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Many theatres require that their staff be members of these organisations. See also Notes Sources External links Theatre Archive Project British Library and University of Sheffield University of Bristol Theatre Collection, Music Hall and Theatre History of Britain and Ireland